Hi, everybody. My name is Shauna, and this is the American English Podcast. My goal here is to teach you the English spoken in the United States. Through common expressions, pronunciation tips, and interesting cultural snippets or stories, I hope to keep this fun, useful, and interesting. Let's do it. Hi, everybody. I hope you're well. In the first part of this lesson, we went through the expression once in a blue moon. In part two, which you're listening to right now, you'll learn all about Rosa Parks, who is often called the first lady of civil rights and the mother of the freedom movement. I've chosen this topic for today, not just because it's a great topic, but because we're nearing June 19th. That's also known as Juneteenth, which is a federal holiday in the United States. And it's a day to commemorate the emancipation of slaves. To be emancipated means to be set free from political or social restrictions. June 19th, 1865 was the first day that the last state with institutional slavery, Texas, abolished it. In other words, they prohibited it. They no longer allowed it. They got rid of it. They abolished it. In order to give you a very clear image of the United States Rosa was born into, we're going to start today by talking a little bit about history. And to be frank, I'm not sure I am the best person to share this history with you, but I hope at the end of this lesson, you will have some sort of topic to talk about in your English class. It's hard, it's dark, but it's a part of American history. In public school, we start learning about the long and complex history of race relations between Caucasians, or specifically white Americans, and black Americans, African Americans, as early as fourth grade. That's when we're about 10 years old. The story they teach at school usually begins with slavery. And here we begin. Black people were taken from Africa to the United States to work as slaves in the early 17th and 18th centuries. History.com estimates that in that time frame, six to seven million slaves were transported on ships. Many of the enslaved families were brought to the deep south. That's where they worked long, hard hours on cotton, sugar, corn, and tobacco plantations. You'll sometimes hear the deep south referred to as the cotton states because cotton was and still is a cash crop. The treatment of slaves on plantations, as you may know from Hollywood and history class, wasn't good. Many lived in small wooden shacks and slept on hay bales or just on the floor. Most were overworked and fed little. Slave owners, on the other hand, or in juxtaposition, in contrast, were often owners of the land, and they would reside in luxurious plantation homes. Many of these homes still exist today. The first big event that occurred in this fight for freedom that was something to celebrate was the end of the Civil War. The Civil War, which happened between 1861 and 1865 was a war between Americans. It was the North versus the South, the Union versus the Confederacy. The Union wanted to abolish slavery. They wanted to get rid of it or prohibit it. The Confederacy wanted to keep it. Abraham Lincoln, who was the 16th president of the United States, led the North, also known as the Union, to victory. And in doing so, he was able to emancipate 4 million slaves, 
according to History.com. Now, these numbers vary from place to place. That's one of the reasons why Lincoln is a very celebrated president. Lincoln proposed the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which passed and made slavery illegal in the United States. This all sounds great, right? It was a victory for freedom, but it was far from the end of struggle. Former slave owners and just intolerant people in general from those former Confederate states were furious. They had lost the war, and they'd also lost their right to free labor. They didn't want to pay the slaves who had been working their land for ages, and former slaves didn't want to work there either. Why would you want to return to a place where you were mistreated? With an overwhelming sentiment of losing control, a lot of these former slave owners pushed for laws that would keep blacks and whites separated. These laws that enforced racial segregation were called Jim Crow laws. It's kind of an odd sounding name. It comes from a character and caricature of black people from the early 1820s. The name of that character was Jump Jim Crow. It was a white guy who wore black face makeup and would entertain audiences. Jim Crow, by the end of the 1830s, became a negative term, or a pejorative term, used to refer to black people. By the 1880s, Jim Crow laws had spread throughout the South. Black people and white people were separated in restaurants, in theaters. They couldn't go to the same parts of parks. And over time, the division grew deeper. Separate elevators were made. Separate building entrances were built. Blacks could not be buried in white cemeteries. They could not drink from the same water fountains or use the same bathrooms. In school buses, city buses, everything was separated. This separated society was what Rosa Parks was born into on February 4, 1913. And her story begins in Alabama, which is a state in which many important events of the civil rights movement take place. Alabama is also known as the heart of Dixie. It's a cotton state. And location-wise, the state has Tennessee to the north, Georgia and Florida to the southeast, Mississippi to the west, and the Gulf of Mexico to the south. Rosa McCauley, later known as Rosa Parks, was born in Tuskegee, Alabama. Her mother, Leona, was a teacher. Her dad, James, a carpenter. At a young age, her parents split up, and she went to live on her grandmother's farm in Pine Level, just outside of the state capital, which is Montgomery. At the time in 1913, racial segregation, or these Jim Crow laws, were in place. Rosa, as a young kid, could see very clearly how treatment of white Americans and African Americans differed. On her walks to school, she saw buses with only white kids headed to an all-white school. White schools from the outside seemed nicer than black schools. In an interview, Rosa recalls her school being one classroom with kids of all ages, little kids all the way up until teenagers. Also, her school was in session five months of the year, not the regular nine months of the year that white kids would go to school. At a young age, she didn't know many white children, nor white adults for that matter. Outside, blacks were treated as inferior. At home, however, on the farm where her family and friends were, she felt safe and free. As a kid, Rosa loved spending time outdoors. She would walk through creeks, examine leaves, trees, and flowers, and she was a hard worker. From an early age, she would sell eggs to neighboring families to earn extra cash. In her free time, she started sewing. To sew, is often mispronounced in English because of its spelling, S-E-W, to sew. 
and it means to join, fasten, or repair something by making stitches with a needle and thread. If you bend over and your pants rip, you might need to sew them back together. S-E-W, sew. By the age of six, Rosa learned all about sewing quilts. Quilts are blankets made of various pieces of patterned fabric. And she did her first quilt by age 10. By age 11, Rosa had sewn her own dress. Rosa's mother, who Rosa was very close to, was a teacher, and she cared greatly about Rosa's education. So at age 11, Rosa was sent to a well-known all-girls school in Montgomery, Alabama. Montgomery felt different and special with its flashy lights, shops, and restaurants. Her school was different, too. All of her teachers were white northerners. It was the first time Rosa was regularly exposed to Caucasians, and the first time white authority figures were telling her that she could and should achieve whatever she set her mind to. Not everyone, though, was on board with the idea of white teachers teaching black children. Remember, this is taking place in the Deep South, and Jim Crow laws were still in place. On two separate occasions, fire was set to the school, and in 1928, it was forced to close. Rosa was gone by then, but the news still hurt. She loved school. In fact, she even dreamed of becoming an educator and was working towards her credentials when her grandmother and mother fell sick. Rosa dropped out of school to take care of them, but later would go back and get her high school diploma making her one of just a handful of African-American women at the time who achieved this. Later on, she'd use her diploma to find a position that would challenge her. When Rosa was 18, she met Raymond Parks, a man who was intelligent and deeply motivated to see change in his community. He liked Rosa. After just one date, he popped the question. Shortly after, in 1932, they were married. By his side, Rosa was exposed to stories of hate crimes and injustice against blacks in the South. Raymond worked for Montgomery's first branch of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which is the oldest and debatably most recognized civil rights group in the U.S., founded back in 1909. He lived and breathed the values of the NAACP to fight for equal rights for blacks and stand up for those who were mistreated. A man like that, in Rosa's eyes, comes about only once in a blue moon. Rosa admired his courage to speak so openly about racial matters, especially in situations when it was not safe to do so. At the time, hate crimes were common. From 1886 to 1968, approximately 4,743 lynchings occurred in the U.S., Lynching is when a mob, a group of people, kills one individual by hanging them, often publicly and usually without due process of the law. Approximately 72% of the lynchings were of African Americans and their white supporters. Most of the hangings were done by the KKK. The KKK or Ku Klux Klan, was a hate group that originally was formed in Tennessee by former Confederate soldiers. You may have heard of the KKK before, as it's not uncommon for them to appear in historical films by Hollywood. They're often described as a white supremacist group. They're anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant, anti-African-American, and the list really goes on. In 1924, at the organization's height, 
historians estimate that there were somewhere between 1.5 and 4 million members. At meetings, KKK members would gather wearing long white robes, face coverings, and pointy white hats. And while in disguise, they would set fire to black schools and churches. They'd burn crosses, which became a symbol for them. As a child, Rosa would sit on her grandparents' farmhouse porch, next to her grandpa, who had a shotgun in his lap. He was afraid the KKK would come to threaten or harm his family. Fear, like the one instilled by the KKK, was ever-present throughout the 30s and 40s. One night in 1943, Rosa went to an NAACP meeting. Being the only woman in the room, she was asked to take notes, since at the time note-taking was a secretary's job, and secretaries were women. From that day forth, she became the official note-taker at the NAACP branch in Montgomery. She organized meetings, wrote informational letters, and eventually advocated for mistreated individuals. The work was unpaid and at nighttime. In 1944, during the day, she worked at Maxwell Field, a military base. The president at the time, FDR, had made it law that on all military bases, blacks and whites would work together, even in the South. So Rosa went to work spent time with her friends and co-workers who were white, but the moment she wanted to go home, she had to board a segregated bus. Whites in the front, blacks in the back. Never could one sit next to another in the same row. To her, it felt behind the times. But how could change occur? Rosa didn't see any black people in politics. Not only that, From 1944 to 1945, only 31 black people out of the 50,000 living in Montgomery were registered to vote. Rosa made it her goal to change that. But first, she needed to register herself. And that was a true eye-opener. As a black woman, she was required to take an extra challenging literacy test about government and law. It took three times for her to pass and cost a $16 poll tax. $16 is equivalent to about $250 today. In order to get people registered, she'd first have to convince people it was worth it, then help them prepare for the test, and help pay the fee. It was an uphill battle. But could it be that there was another way? Civil disobedience. In English, the word civil means polite or well-mannered. You can tell two arguing children, please be civil. In other words, be polite to one another. Civil disobedience is a polite refusal to obey the law. Acts of civil disobedience are nonviolent and peaceful, and they were very common during the civil rights movement. Rosa's story is one of the first. In 1955, Rosa sat down in one of the seats reserved for black people on a bus. I was arrested on December 1st, 1955, for refusing to stand up on the orders of the bus driver after the uh, white seats had been occupied in the front. And of course, I was not in the front of the bus, as many people and many people have ridden and spoken that I was, that I got on the bus and took a front seat, but I did not. I took a seat that was just back of where the white people were sitting. When the bus started to fill up, the bus driver, Jim Blake, told everyone in the row that they needed to stand up in order to let a white man sit. Some white people boarded the bus and left one man standing, and when the driver noticed him standing, he told us to stand up and let him have those seats. He referred to them as front seats. Three people got up to make way, but Rosa didn't stand. He wanted to know if I was going to stand. I told him I was not, and he told me he would have me arrested. 
I told him he may do that. That's exactly what happened. The police came, took Rosa off the bus, brought her to City Hall for fingerprints, and then she went to jail. Word spread quickly of her arrest. Since she was such a calm, friendly woman and extremely well-respected within the community. The head of the NAACP, Edgar Nixon, paid $100 to bail her out, but it wasn't over. Rosa was to be put on trial. Nixon convinced her then and there that there might be a way to turn her trial into an opportunity. If she filed a lawsuit against the bus companies, Could she somehow eliminate separation on buses? Nixon was convinced that Rosa was the right person to do it. Her record was clean. She was calm and respectful. She wasn't the first to refuse to get off a bus, but she had the perfect image to carry out this plan. Prior to the trial on December 5, 1955, the NAACP wanted everyone to understand the stakes and support Rosa. On December 5th, they wanted everyone to boycott riding the buses. Flyers were posted all across the city, inside shops, on light poles. Even ministers told churchgoers not to ride the buses. To Rosa's surprise, everyone cooperated. The morning of December 5th, the streets were packed with people walking. People were so supportive of the cause that the bus boycott continued for over a year. Bus business depended on black passengers, and they lost a significant amount of money. There were death threats against those who supported it. Some were fired. Martin Luther King Jr., who is one of the most famed civil rights activists, had his house bombed because he supported these boycotts. Now, Rosa was found guilty in court, exactly as Fred Gray, her lawyer, had wished. He appealed, meaning that the case could be taken to a higher court. Montgomery's boycott was all over national headlines. People sent money to support the cause, and Rosa became the spokesperson for everything going on. She traveled around the U.S., talking about racial equality, civil rights, and freedom. She went to Madison Square Park and spoke in front of thousands of people. She also met with Eleanor Roosevelt, the First Lady, who was a strong supporter of equality regardless of color. On November 13, 1956, the U.S. Supreme Court claimed that bus segregation was illegal. It was a huge victory, one that instilled hope everywhere. The subtle refusal to give up her seat on a bus is often viewed as sort of the beginning of the civil rights movement. Of course, shortly before, in 1954, there was a famous case called Brown versus the Board of Education, where racially segregated public schools became unconstitutional in the U.S., So that is also sometimes considered the first. In any case, Rosa went back to Montgomery. But even though she was seen as a heroine for many, she couldn't get a job. Nobody would hire her. She even received death threats. So she moved to Detroit, Michigan, far from Alabama. Rosa never stopped fighting for equality. The bus boycott gave momentum to a number of other events in the civil rights movement. And throughout her lifetime, she watched as the United States started to transform. In the 1960s, she watched the sit-ins. Sit-ins at restaurants were another act of civil disobedience. Black people would go into all-white restaurants, sit at the counter, and try and order food. They'd sit peacefully until they were thrown out, oftentimes harshly. It was televised. Sit-ins spread throughout the South. In 1963, Rosa went to the Lincoln Memorial and saw Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. I have a dream that one day 
this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Fun fact, it was because of the support of the bus boycott that the Montgomery Improvement Association was formed on December 5th, the same day as Rosa's trial. That's the day that Martin Luther King went from being a minister, a well-respected one, to being the president of the association, spokesperson, and a prominent figure in the civil rights movement. In 1964, Rosa cheered as Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act, which got rid of Jim Crow laws. Let me just reiterate, these Jim Crow laws that created systemic racial segregation in the South and denied equal rights to African Americans existed for almost 100 years. 100 years. With the Civil Rights Act signed, black people could be served at restaurants. They could share the same fountains, visit the same hotels. Public places truly became public. If a place did not allow it, they could be sued or go out of business. In 1965, the Voting Act was put in place, which made literacy tests illegal. Remember, that was the test that Rosa needed to take in order to be able to vote. It was a test only required of African Americans. It also ensured that everybody, regardless of color, was eligible to vote if they are a citizen of the U.S. In 1965, the same year, Rosa started working for a representative, John Conyers Jr., an African-American U.S. representative. In 1975, Rosa returned to Alabama. By then, lots had changed. Black studies became a field of study at universities. African-Americans were finally in politics again, including... Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman in Congress. She received many awards and medals. In 1966, she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the highest honor. Time magazine named Rosa one of the 20 most important people of the 20th century. In 1987, Rosa and Raymond established an Institute for Self-Development designed to help the youth in Detroit. She was active until her last day. When Rosa died in 2005, 4,000 people attended her funeral. She was a woman whose courage changed history. Thanks for listening to this episode. I mentioned in the beginning that I didn't feel like I was the best person to tell this story. And I still feel that way. I hope you enjoyed it anyway. I hope I did a little bit of justice to Rosa Parks. She is truly an incredible woman. The only woman up until 2005 who got to lie in honor at the U.S. Capitol after her death. History would not be the same without her. The United States wouldn't look at all the same without her story. When Lucas and I were dating, we spent three months in Austin, Texas, and took a road trip to New Orleans, Louisiana. Along the way, we stopped at a plantation home for about an hour or two. I highly recommend, if you're ever in the South, to go to a plantation home because most of them nowadays offer a tour so that you can see this dark side of American history. It's intense and, yeah, really shocking to see the sort of conditions that slaves endured on a daily basis. Alabama is home to many historic sites of the civil rights movement. It's where the Montgomery bus boycott occurred, where freedom rides occurred the famous Freedom March from Selma to Montgomery. You can visit the First Baptist Church, where Martin Luther King 
spoke before crowds. You can go to the Rosa Parks Museum in Montgomery or the Civil Rights Museum in Birmingham. Alabama in general is one of the states that I've heard very positive things about, that it's just shockingly beautiful. There are lakes everywhere. It's very green. If you do go there, you might also consider checking out Alligator Alley. You can see 450 alligators there. Uh, you can actually hold a baby alligator. You can visit the magnificent Cathedral Caverns, which has massive stalagmites, or even check out the spectacular views of dismalites, which are worms that glow a bluish green past twilight. And they make caves and forests in Dismal's Canyon look like the night sky. In any case, there's so much to do in Alabama. I definitely recommend connecting with this part of American history. And until next time, bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the American English Podcast. Remember, it's my goal here to not only help you improve your listening comprehension, but to show you how to speak like someone from the States. If you want to receive the full transcript for this episode, or you just want to support this podcast, make sure to sign up to premium content on AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. Thanks and hope to see you soon.